For Karima Media's Policy, I'm Sashni Madli. Joining me today is political commentator and author Justice Malala, here to discuss his latest book, The Plot to Save South Africa. So it was interesting to read about your own family's history. And you write that your father worked at a mine and that your siblings joined the ANC and one of your brothers was even in detention. Can you just tell us a little about your family's early political years? I mean, it's one of those South, South African stories um, where, where you're just political just by, by your very being. Um, so my father worked on an Anglo-American mine just off Elof Street towards Terrefontaine. Uh, the way the, the mining compounds worked was that you had a you had the family compounds and you had the hostels. And so uh, my dad had a family and so we we grew up, we were born uh, rather um, in the so-called family compounds where the married uh, and you had to be a clerk or something like that, a professional-ish kind of person to live there. And then, you know, the Gruberias Act kicked in and, and essentially black families were kicked out of the city. We lived in Soweto. We were touched by the 1976 riots. Uh, when those happened, we lived in uh, White City, Jabavu, which is not far from uh, the four schools where the riots started, uh, Maurice Isaacson and, three, and the three others, but Maurice Isaacson was the most famous. So then <laughs> my father was, got panicked, basically, and said, my kids won't get an education in Soweto. And so we were taken off to north of Pretoria, uh, a place called Hamanskral. Uh, that's where uh, Hemen Mashava comes from. That's where uh, Ntato Matlana comes from. Uh, that's where a whole bunch of good people come from. Um, but Hamanskral was essentially a bit of a dumping ground, if you will, for the apartheid government of the time in the 70s. The village which I grew up in, New Easteris, was made up of people who'd been kicked out of Lady Selborne, which was a racially mixed neighborhood, uh, a bit of the Sophia town of Pretoria, if you will. Um, it was made up of people who were considered too dark to be colored. Um, uh, uh, people like ourselves who came from, you know, Soweto. It was it was a mixture of people. So in a sense, the community itself was very political, even before being organized. The very aware of the impact of apartheid and of apartheid laws on people that they could break up families. It was heartbreaking that half the relatives would be in. Uh, a township called Irsteres near near Pretoria, um, and half would be uh, in Hammanskral because the one half was just a shade darker than the other half, and so forth. It was terrible. It was it was, yeah, it was just terrible. Um, but anyway, so what ha what then happens is that in that village in the early nineteen eighties, young people start going off to university, a friend of mine, uh, Sol Mulubi, was, was probably the first, one of the first people to go off to uh, what was called Tef Luop, no, then uh, the University of the North. He comes back after being politicized himself, he comes back with all these ideas and all these books and, uh, and starts telling people about how oppressed they are and conscientizing and starts a youth organization. Well, my older brother, who's four years older than me, um, becomes hugely involved in this, uh, is detained by the Putatswana Homeland Police at the time, spends about six months in detention without trial. In fact, we didn't even know which police station he was in. And so and so politics was very much part of the of the family background, part of who we were. And and for myself, I mean, I wasn't as hugely political. I just enjoyed the reading and the writing of politics. And when I got into journalism, I sort of segued very quickly towards that. I it just seemed as if I knew everything about that sort of stuff than <laughs> than most people did. Now, this book in particular focuses on the aftermath of Chris Hani's murder, and it was a volatile few weeks in South Africa back then. And you were in the newsroom as a rookie journalist when the news came in that he had been shot. What were your thoughts and emotions when you heard the news? 
Well, you know, Trishani was such a massive figure, even before 1990, when he he and other exiles uh, came back uh, into South Africa, uh, when the ANC was unbanned and so forth. Um, his name was legend. People whispered about him, people who had been out of the country or had, had been exposed to political literature, they knew about his, you know, he was the chief of staff of MK, he was uh, a member of the Central Committee of the SACP, the NEC, young guy, dynamic. In the 1990s, with, with Nelson Mandela and, and, and the key leaders uh, coming out of prison, there'd be rallies all over South Africa, and they were attended by thousands and thousands of people. Uh, Chris Hani was one of those, if he was speaking, then you made sure to be there because he was charismatic. He was fearless. He was militant. He didn't behave as if there were leaders and followers. Uh, I, I, I had him speak once uh, early on in, in the 1990s. I think it was in Atrishville. And, and one of those speeches... It was almost like he was briefing his counterparts in the National Executive Committee of the ANC in a, in a big stadium full of people. But he was saying, this is what's happening with the negotiations. These are the forces that are aligned in this way and this way. It was almost like you were sitting in a seminar with an incredibly connected, incredibly smart guy who was, who was putting you in the picture so that you yourself, whether you're a 20 year old kid or, or whatever, that you could go and sit in those negotiations and say, okay, given what we now know about each other and about the balance of forces, as, as the ANC used to put it, um, this is how it's going to pan out. And he was incredible that way, that, that he could speak to ordinary people, to ordinary activists, and, and make them feel that they were part of this big, big thing that was unfolding in the country. So Chris Hani was part of this, this powerful movement that was coming back into the country, uh, the ANC and, and the PAC and so forth, that the struggle was, was just. They held the moral high ground. And he, among them, was, was one of those people who inspired young people, who, who made you believe that... that We've reached a point in this country where, where the future belongs to all of us. The idea of Chris Hani was really the idea of South Africa. It was the face of liberation for so many of us. And so his assassination was, oh, this is, it's an assault on the process uh, of negotiation. It was an assault on the idea of democracy, of equality for for everyone in the country. I was I was quite devastated. I was shattered. In the moment, of course, I was sort of numb and 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 I, I you know got in a car, went off to Don Park, uh, took notes, came back to the newsroom, did what needed to be done. But my thoughts were this thing is not going anywhere if people like Trisani are going to be murdered and, and assassinated in this way. So I was scared. Um, I felt like my own dreams were were under assault, um, and the dreams of of South Africa and South Africans were under assault in a similar manner. So, so it was a hugely devastating at a personal level. Uh, even though I didn't know him personally, it was devastating. I could see the devastation of people on the streets. I mean, for me, one of the things about South Africa is that the emotion is right in front of you. It's raw, it's, it's... So when, when you're reporting and you're going out and people are actually crying in the streets and people are, that day at the house, you had all the key ANC leaders and a lot of people and myself, you know, we talk about Tokyo Sohwale and that image of him tying uh, in front of the house with, with Jill Marcus and Bazima Shiloa. But actually, people were just collapsing around. You know, it was, how can this happen? And what does this mean? So it was a hugely devastating moment. Now, you also write in the book that for former President Nelson Mandela, Chris Hani was a friend and a potential foe. Can you just explain that? Um, You know, I think... 
the ANC, in many ways, one speaks of the ANC is this big animal. It fights in the 1950s, the defense campaign. Uh, Mandela goes off and starts MK and, um, and takes military training, is arrested, goes to prison. Um, Oliver Tambo goes off to Lusaka and elsewhere in the world establishes the ANC in exile. And in many ways, we think of it as this monolithic animal that had one big intent. But actually, the, the you know, in the ANC, there were people who said, I'm sorry, what is this 1990 and why are they releasing our leaders and, and, and banning? There's, a, there's something going on here. And we don't believe this. We don't believe the regime because it's lied and lied and lied for decades. Um, there were people who said, why are we negotiating? Our... You know, the negotiation process was was difficult because in a way, why should I negotiate one person, one vote? Um, it's basically saying, let me negotiate my own humanity because you're entitled to one vote and you're saying, no, but no, you, you, you shouldn't get it. It's, it's, a, it's a hugely disquieting thing to actually be in a position where you're, you're, you're negotiating something that should not, it's a non-negotiable. It's one person, one vote. Let's just get the mechanics right and so forth. But, you know, it's a complex country and all that. And so, so that was what was happening. So Chris Hani was someone who could call out people like Mandela and say, but uh, aren't we giving away too much here? Let's not forget that we are we are on the righteous path here. History is behind us. We can't, you can't negotiate your own humanity, really. So Mandela was very conscious and wanted to keep him close to him all the time. Not just him, another uh, a person who was like that. Mandela loved them both. Uh, Bantu Holomisa uh, was that other person. Um, but he knew that these were people who had a massive constituency among young people who were suspicious of the cleric of the National Party, of the National Party government, and of what their intentions were. And they were worried that Mandela and his comrades were prepared to make big concessions and concessions that would have an impact on democracy. So Mandela found them very useful as well, because he could go into a meeting with the clerk and say, you want me to go outside and tell Bantu Holomisa and uh, Chris Hani that, uh, that no, we are agreeing to give you a guarantee that you will have seats in parliament, a guarantee. I mean, you think they'll accept it? And the clerk and his delegation would be, well, I mean, those guys are not... You know, so he used them in a sense as his, oh, but he also was aware that they could turn around and say, but well, are you selling us out? What is going on here? So he kept them close. In a way, Mandela saw his younger self in the militancy of Krishani. So politically, he knew that we have a process, let's try to keep to it. And he knew that they had the ability to almost derail it, but he he appreciated them at the same time. So it was a love, I wouldn't say love-hate, but it was a love, um, I'm watching you kind of relationship uh, between between Mandela and, and uh, uh, Chris Hani and a few others. Now, Mandela and the ANC used the immediate aftermath of Chris Hani's death to get a grip on the negotiation process and bring about democratic elections. Can you just tell us a bit more about this plan or the strategy? So, so... Chris Hani was murdered in the morning on the morning of the 10th of April, 1993. Mandela came back from uh, Kunu that day. The next day, Cyril Ramaphosa, who was the chief negotiator and secretary general of the ANC at the time, uh, had organized a national executive committee meeting, an emergency one. Uh, they met um, at what used to be called Shell House uh, on Plain Street in Johannesburg near Park Station. Not everyone was there, but a huge chunk had come back from wh wherever they were. Um, other people, uh, Peter Mukaba, Mbazima Shiloa, uh, at the time known as Sam Shiloa, and others were, were there, but were not part of the, of the NEC itself. In that meeting, you know, that debate about 
you know, should we call off negotiations? What does this mean? This is terrible and so forth. Everyone is in mourning. Everyone is in is devastated about about what has taken place. And so in that meeting, the ANC says, but we need to say we are hurt. This is a provocation, but let's use it positively. And the positive thing is what we have been asking for all along and demanding of the of the apartheid government under the CLEC. And that is one, we need an absolute guarantee about that we will have an election date. And secondly, the establishment of a transitional executive council. And the transitional executive council was essentially a body that would oversee chunks of the administration, the army and so forth, they would fall under the TEC so that we had a free and fair election that was not being overseen by the by one of the players, which would have been the, the national party. So this is the message that Mandela through Cyril Ramaphosa sent to the cleric uh, through Rulf Meyer, who was the chief negotiator on the other side. Essentially, the communication from then was people are angry. We need to give them something that shows that this is not the event that stops this process. They need to have something that looks beyond Chris Hani and, and that should be an election day. The, the key thing about the way the negotiations worked was that the ANC and the NP were the main players. Everyone else was trying to be I'm I'm in there and I need to be consulted. So around FWD Cleric was Mango Sutubitelezi, Lucas Mangope, a few of the Bantustan leaders. Um, on the other side was Mandela, the liberation movements, uh, PAC, Azapo. PAC and Azapo were actually not quite in, but they, they would pitch up sometimes at the negotiations and walk away. Uh, the SACP and others. So so the clerk always used that as an excuse that I can't I can't give you an election date. I've got to ask the other guys. And and yet that was like, no, actually it's the ANC and the and the and the National Party who are really um, um at play here. I go on to write about how on the Wednesday after the 10th of April, essentially the National Party. Uh, caved in at the state security council meeting where where they said look we will agree on an election date we just need to get the other people into the room and we'll do it and that happened on june 3 1993 where they they agreed on on april 27 as the date um the ifp said it would never happen uh, others said it would never happen, but the, the agreement was made and on June 3, um, April 27 became the the date on which all parties said, okay, we'll do it on, on that year. So from that week of Trishani's murder, um, that, that was the key outcome. We had an election date. Um, and then soon after we had a process towards establishing a transitional executive committee and that happened in December 1993, when essentially Ramaphosa, Rolf Meyer, and a bunch of others uh, formed the Transitional Executive Committee, and it sat in Cape Town. Lastly, Justice, you write that comparing today's leaders against Chris Hani is unfair. Can you just tell us why? <laughs> it's unfair in many ways. And it's fair in many ways. So I'm 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 conflicted about it. Chris Hani was such a big figure in in our politics, but many others were big figures. You know, um, the the ANC structures were always divided into into sort of two. There was always the military uh, component. So people would say, "Wow, you know, Chris Hani and." Uh, and a whole bunch of others were, were, were the heroes because these are the guys who infiltrated the country, uh, set up, you know, military targets, uh, bombs and so forth. So there was a, a worshipping, if you will, and a respect and so forth of those people. Then there were people like Tabo Mbeki who were intellectuals and talking strategy and geopolitics and so forth. Now, if you take that whole bunch of leadership and say, 
what did they say about a new South Africa? If you go and look at their speeches, Tawam Beke in the 1980s, we will do this, we will become this and so forth. Jacob Zuma in the 1980s and early 90s, uh, we will be a government of the people, we will not forget where we come from and so forth and so forth. None of these leaders, Cyril Ramaphosa, um, all of them were pretty much playing on the same, uh, uh, you know, in agreement that a new kind of democracy, a, a, a humane kind of leadership would come into play uh, post-1994. Chris Honey died, he was murdered. Um, so his words are frozen in time. Before 1993, we knew he said these amazing things. Uh, let's not get seduced by the Mercedes Benzes. Let's not do this and so forth. Post-1994, Jacob Zuma um, wants the Mercedes Benz. Um, Cyril Ramaphosa gets the Mercedes Benz and the millions. Um, Tabon Beki gets all sorts of other things and so forth. But, but at the heart of it is, have, have those who stayed behind remained true to that people-centered democracy they talked about? So, so it's difficult to judge Chris Hani because he, he, has, he didn't have the experience. His life was cut short um, too early because we don't know, would he have agreed to the arms deal? A lot of people say he was murdered because perhaps um, he would have stood up against the arms deal and so forth and so forth. But we went on in 19, post-1994, instead of spending money on teachers and all sorts of other things, we shut down teacher training colleges and bought arms at, at vast, vast expense and so forth and so forth. So, so it's unfair, I think, to say this one person who, who was murdered in a terrible, terrible act to hold him up, to compare him to... to those leaders today. On the other hand, it's possible to use his words to say to his comrades today, have you lived up to these expectations? Look what your comrades said about you, that you will be seduced by the Mercedes Benz and the and so forth, and you'll forget about the poor. And and when you hear about William Komape dying in a pit latrine, uh, children today 29 years into democracy dying uh, in these in these terrible toilets then you have to say <laughs> you know i think we failed we failed as a democracy that so much potential has been wasted has been trampled on and so i think i think chris Hani, in a way chris Hani reminds us his words remind us that actually we we we're so far from what we said we would be, and and we could be so, so much further. Uh, we could have achieved so much more. So there is a there is a dying of dreams there. There is a there is a sadness about about Chris Hania. and I think that sadness will continue. I think next year and the year after. I think in forty years we'll be looking back and saying Chris Hani wonders about about these things, um, unless we change course very quickly. But it's unfair and it's fair in many ways to use Chris Hani as that measuring rod uh, for our current dispensation. That was political commentator and author Justice Malala discussing his latest book, The Plot to Save South Africa.